Texas, the man you believe killed President Kennedy. I think we have the right man. He was cuffed, fingerprinted, booked for murder. Does he confess anything? No. Come on, the president. But before he could be tried. I don't know what this is all about. Before he was found innocent or proven guilty. Lee Oswald has been tried. He was silenced forever. The world may never know the truth about the crime of the century. Now his case goes to court. Is he innocent or guilty? A&E presents The Trial of the Harvey Oswald. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. It's a question that's been debated thousands of different ways in this country for nearly three decades. Is Lee Harvey Oswald guilty or not guilty of assassinating President John F. Kennedy on a sunny November day in Dallas, Texas in 1963? For the first time in our final installment of The Trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, a jury made up of 12 Dallas citizens will be asked to reach a verdict. We have heard hours of testimony from real witnesses, arguments from real attorneys. They have seen real evidence. Before they begin their deliberations, defense attorney Jerry Spence will present his final witness. Closing arguments from both Mr. Spence and Prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi will follow, and then the jury will decide. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in the proceedings for this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Fine. Please take a seat. Can just talk. have a seat right there, please? <clears throat> Mr. Cantor, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury who you are? My name is Seth Cantor. I live in Washington, D.C. And what do you do? I'm a newspaper reporter. And uh, what were you doing on the day the president was murdered. I had accompanied the president from Washington, D.C. on the press plane uh, to Texas, and uh, in Dallas I was in the motorcade as it, as it came into Dealey Plaza. Later were you present uh, uh, when Lee Harvey Oswald, my client, was arrested and taken into custody? I was at uh, Parkland Hospital and uh, went out to Love Field where the new president was sworn in, and then I rode downtown to the police station and when I got there they had arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. Describe the scene at the Parkland Hospital in Dallas for the ju jury, please. Well, I arrived at uh, Parkland Hospital just very shortly after the president was brought in and I saw the car that the president and um, his wife and the Connollys had been riding in. Uh, a door was open, there was blood on the ground, there was a bouquet of crushed roses in the back seat of the <clears throat> car. You'd have wanted to plant bullet particles in there, could you have done so? If I'd wanted to, yes. Could anybody? I believe so. Did you later see somebody there that became noted or notorious in the saga of the assassination of our president? Well, are you referring to Jack Ruby? Yes. Yes. I did not see Jack Ruby in that immediate area of the emergency room. I saw Jack Ruby and spoke with him and shook hands with him uh, some distance away in the hospital as I was on my way to uh, the press conference, an emergency press conference. How did you happen to know Jack Ruby? I had been a reporter in Dallas previous to moving to Washington. I was on the Dallas Times Herald, frequently wrote uh, feature stories. Uh, came across various characters uh, in town and uh, Jack Ruby was one of those and Jack Ruby was the kind of person who hung around uh, newspaper city rooms and uh, hung around with the police and uh, he was in full evidence usually at sporting events, boxing matches, football games, things like that. He'd and he was there where the president was, where the president's body was? He was in Parkland Hospital, yes. Were you around when uh, uh, Jack Ruby shot my client? Yes, I was. Do we have the clip of the killing of Lee? I'd like the jury to see that, please. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Now, did you make some inquiry into the background of Jack Ruby? 
I hadn't intended to make uh, <clears throat> inquiry into his background uh, in the years that I lived in Dallas, but I knew somewhat something about his background then, and then eventually I made a concerted effort to look into it. And was that in connection with the writing of a book that you, that you did? It was. Did you get some information by suing the United States government under the Freedom of Information Act in order to write your book, sir? Yes, I did. And as what was part of the information that you got as a result of that lawsuit, the telephone records of Jack Ruby? Yes. Could you give me 254, please? Now, this is a chart, sir, as you know. What does, would you explain it to the jury? Would you just step down here very quickly and explain it to the jury? Well, this is a chart showing uh, Jack Ruby's toll calls from both his home and uh, his place of business, a striptease club in downtown Dallas, uh, to, uh, to various people. In particular, it shows uh, during the months of September through November uh, an upsurge in, uh, in Jack Ruby's uh, phone calls. And did you find out to who those calls were made? Well, they included calls to people like uh, Barney Baker, who was a, a lieutenant of uh, Jimmy Hoffa, and a, uh, he weighed about 300 pounds, and he had a reputation for being quite a, a muscle man. Um, how about Nafio Picora? Nafio Picora, uh, also a member of the underworld, was included, and so was David Yaris. And uh, Mr. Kanner, you can sit down. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I have to see it. Let me see. Yes, right here. It's not a Picora, Lieutenant Fork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's not right. Picora. Were you present when Mr. Uh, uh, Oswald uh, was brought out? Was hauled through at the press conference uh, and, and made some statements about about wanting help. I was. Would you produce that clip, please, for us at this time? The question by Judge Hargoire protested at that time that I was not allowed legal representation uh, during that, uh, that uh, very short and sweet hearing. Uh, I really don't know what, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of, uh, of uh, murdering a policeman. I know nothing more than that, and I do request uh, for someone to come forward uh, to give me uh, a legal assistance. Now, were you present uh, when Lee told the world as he was being hauled down the hall that he was a patsy? I was. May we have the clip of that, please? It's not allowed me to, to have any. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. I go for a black guy. No, it's all right. Back up, man. Sit down. Come on, man. No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I live in the city. What about the police? I'm just a patsy. Thank you. As a a result of your investigation, did you discover whether or not Jack Ruby had in fact been an informant for the FBI? Yes, he had been. And how do you know that, sir? I obtained uh, FBI records. And did, how did you obtain those records? Through the Freedom of Information Act. Federal. What did those records reveal in that regard? That Jack Ruby had been uh, what the FBI called a, a PCI, a potential criminal informer signed up uh, with the FBI in the fall of 1959. Are you acquainted with the request of Mr. Ruby to be taken away from Dallas and to be taken instead to Washington so that he could testify? He asked several times, yes sir. Do you know, several, as a matter of fact, how many times? Seven times. Seven separate times to be taken to Washington? During the course of um, his interview with the Chief Justice. May we have, uh, there was a public interview at the time of the trial, was there not? Yes, there was. May we have the clip of that, please? The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. Uh, in other words, I'm the only person in the background that knows the truth pertaining to everything relating to my 
like it. Do you think it'll ever come out? No, because... Uh, unfortunately... Uh, the... Uh, the people have, that have so much to gain and have such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in will never let the true fact come of that board to the, to the world. Now, these people are in a very high position, Jack. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Cantor. You may examine. Mr. Cantor, Jack Ruby was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death for his killing of Oswald. Is that correct? That is correct, and He sir. died on January the 3rd, 1967, from natural causes while in custody? That's correct. You agree, do you not, that there's absolutely no evidence that Jack Ruby and Lee Harvey Oswald knew each other? I agree to that, sir. And when you saw Ruby at Parkland Hospital, you thought it was perfectly normal, though, to see him there because he was, as you described, a goer to events and a man about town? Yes, sir. You're also aware, are you not, that at Ruby's trial, there was medical testimony that his electroencephalograms to measure the electric activity of the brain showed that he had organic brain damage? Yes, I remember that. And that this brain damage was probably traceable to psychomotor epilepsy? I do remember So you that. would agree, would you not, that Mr. Uh, Ruby was mentally and emotionally, he was not a well man? He, he, he might not fall within the pattern of the norm. Okay. Mr. Uh, Cantor, you will agree and you've so said that the evidence is clear that Jack Ruby had a very deep affection for President Kennedy. There's all types of evidence of that. Yes, sir. And at the hospital where you saw Jack Ruby at Parkland Hospital, he had tears in his eyes. Is that correct? Yes, he was obviously under emotional strain. Yes, sir. And that he later said that uh, he even felt worse than when his mother and father died? He did, yes, sir. Mr. Cantor, you agree, do you not, that the general consensus of those like yourself who have studied Ruby is that Ruby thought he would be a hero to the world for having killed Oswald, a presidential assassin. Is that not true? I'm certain of it, yes, sir. Okay. You've testified to phone calls that Ruby made to crime figures and some meetings he had with various crime figures. Is that correct? I did. But Ruby had been associated with these crime figures for many years. Yes, he, he had been. Okay. And he had regular contact with them throughout the years. Is that not true? No, that's not entirely true. Uh, some of those calls that he made and some of the visits he received from some of those same yeah. people uh, shortly before the assassination were with people who he'd been out of contact with for quite some time. Okay. Are you aware that the House Select Committee on Assassinations investigated these same phone calls that you testified to and concluded, quote, Testimony to the committee supported the conclusion that Ruby's phone calls were, by and large, related to his labor troubles. Is that correct? Well, I, I don't, uh, I can't out and out dispute it. It's just that these people who he was telephoning uh, were well and deeply connected with the underworld. Okay. Mr. Kenner, are you implying to this jury that by Ruby saying that he had something to say and wanted to go to Washington, that he was referring to a conspiracy? Are you implying that to the jury? I'm I hope that I'm implying, uh, members of the jury, that, that Jack Ruby uh, was maintaining that he had more information to reveal, yes. Okay. Now, I ask you this. How could you possibly say that, Mr. Cantor, when in the same identical testimony of Mr. Ruby before the Warren Commission, he specifically and expressly said that no one else was involved with him? So we know, Mr. Cantor, that when Jack Ruby was talking to the Chief Justice about going to Washington, he had to have been talking about something other than a conspiracy. I don't agree with that, sir. For one thing, uh, one of his early attorneys, a man named Joe Tonahill from Jasper, Texas, uh, told me that uh, uh, he was positive, and, and Mr. Tonahill was present during that interview with the Chief Justice, that he, Mr. Tonahill, was positive that, uh, that the room uh, was bugged, okay. that, that uh, Ruby's words were being carried elsewhere and that okay. uh, it was not a safe place for Ruby to be so he far He didn't know that, but he suspected the room was bugged. All right. Well, if that's I, why he wanted to go to Washington. Okay. That's, if I, that's correct. Did he ever testify or tell anyone why he wanted to go to Washington? I'm not aware of it. Thank you very much, sir. Rick. <clears throat> well, you believe there was a Ruby cover-up from your investigation? Oh, I certainly do, yes, sir. Would you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury why? I believe that uh, <clears throat> a lot of evidence points to the fact that Jack Ruby was led into the police station on purpose uh, that Sunday morning to 
with the express purpose of killing uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Why do you believe that? Well, I believe uh, for one of two reasons. Either he was being used by a force that he wasn't either, even aware of, or there was a small number of uh, Dallas police officers who felt very strongly about the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald had, had killed one of their own number, and they wanted revenge. And they would not be able to obtain revenge once, once Lee Harvey Oswald was transferred to uh, uh, jurisdiction of the Dallas County. That's your theory of the matter. That's correct. Uh, at least it's your theory that somebody unknown to you or anybody else made arrangements for him to get in. It took me a lot longer to get in than it took Jack Ruby that morning, that Sunday morning. And he was on the scene uh, regularly throughout the weekend coming into and leaving the police department at will. Thank you, Mr. Cantor. You may step down. Thank you. Defense rest. Defense rest. Closing arguments when the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald continues here on a &E. We now return to the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. Members of the jury, we are now going to have final summations or final arguments by the attorneys. Since the burden is on the United States government to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, the prosecution has the opportunity to address you first. Then the defendant's attorney will address you. Then the final summation will be done by the prosecution. Suliosi, you may proceed, sir. Mr. Spence, Judge Martin, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in the brief time I have to address you, uh, address you in this historic trial, I want to point out what must already be obvious to you that Lee Harvey Oswald and Lee Harvey Oswald alone is responsible for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, our young and vigorous leader whose presidency stirred the hopes of millions of Americans for a better world and whose shocking death grieved and anguished an entire nation. But before I summarize that evidence for you against Mr. Oswald, evidence that conclusively proves his guilt beyond all reasonable doubt, I want to discuss several issues with you which the defense has raised during this trial. Several factors make it clear that Kennedy and Connolly were struck by the same bullet. There's absolutely no evidence of the existence of any separate bullet hitting Connolly. With respect to whether or not any shots were fired from the grassy knoll, I want to make the following observations. Firstly, it is perfectly understandable that the witnesses were confused as to the origin of fire. Not only does Dealey Plaza resound with echoes, but here you have a situation of completely unexpected shots over just a matter of a few moments. When you compound all of that with the fact that the witnesses were focusing their attention on the President of the United States driving by, a mesmerizing event for many of them, and the chaos, the hysteria, the bedlam that engulfed the assassination scene, it's remarkable that there was any coherence at all to what they thought they saw and heard. Human observation, notoriously unreliable under even the most optimum situation, has to give way to hard scientific evidence. And we do have indisputable scientific evidence in this case that the bullets which struck President Kennedy came from his rear, not his front. If either of the two bullets that struck President Kennedy came from the front, why weren't there any entrance wounds to the front of the president's body, nor any exit wounds to the rear of his body? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it could be more obvious that there was no gunman at the grassy knoll. No one saw anybody with a rifle in that area. No weapon, nor expended cartridges from a weapon were found there. It didn't happen. With respect to Ruby killing Oswald, the evidence is overwhelming that he was a very emotional man. When we couple the fact that Ruby cared deeply for Kennedy with the fact that he probably thought that he would be viewed as a hero, Ruby's killing of Oswald has all the earmarks of a very personal killing completely devoid of any outside influence. In the short time I have left, I want to summarize the evidence of guilt against Mr. Oswald. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, within minutes of the assassination, a 6.5 millimeter Mannlicher Carcano rifle, serial number C-2766, 
was found on the sixth floor of the Book Depository Building. Oswald ordered the rifle under the name A. Hedell. We know that. We know from the testimony of Monty Lutz, the firearms expert, that the two large bullet fragments found inside the presidential limousine were parts of a bullet fired from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of all other weapons. We also know from the firearms people that the three expended cartridge casings found on the floor right beneath that sixth floor window, undoubtedly the same casings that Mr. Norman heard fall from above, were fired in and ejected from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of all other weapons. So we know, not just beyond a reasonable doubt, we know beyond all doubt that Oswald's rifle was the murder weapon that caused that terrible, terrible spray of brain matter to the front. The worst sight that I've ever seen in my entire life. And it's obvious that Oswald carried that rifle into the building that day in that large brown paper bag. It couldn't be more obvious. As far as Mr. Fraser's testimony about Oswald carrying the bag under his armpit, he conceded he never paid close attention to just how Oswald was carrying that bag. He didn't have any reason to. At this point, if we had nothing else, nothing else, how much do you need? If we had nothing else. This would be enough to prove Oswald's guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. But there's so much more. Let's look at Oswald's conduct. November the 22nd, 1963, the day of the assassination, was a Friday. Whenever Oswald would go to visit his wife in Irving, <clears throat> go on a Friday evening, <clears throat> come back on a Monday morning. On the week of the assassination, however, for the very first time, he goes there on a Thursday evening, obviously to get his rifle for the following day. After the assassination, all the other employees of the book depository building return to work. There's a roll call, they're accounted for, not Oswald. He takes off. The only employee who leaves the building. Just 45 minutes after the assassination, out of the 500,000 or so people in Dallas, Lee Harvey Oswald is the one out of those 500,000 500, people who just happens to murder Officer J.D. Tippett. Oswald's responsibility for President Kennedy's assassination explains, explains why he was driven to murder Officer Tippett. The murder bore the signature of a man in desperate flight from some awful deed. What other reason under the moon would he have had to kill Officer Tippett? Normally, ladies and gentlemen, in a murder case, a verdict of guilty brings about a certain measure of justice, obviously a limited amount of justice, but a certain measure of justice for the victim and his or her surviving loved ones. But here, the effect of this assassination went far beyond President Kennedy and his family. This was an enormous offense against the American people. And no justice could ever be achieved. I respectfully ask you to return a swift verdict of guilty against Lee Harvey Oswald, simply because it is the only verdict that is consistent with the evidence, evidence which conclusively proves Oswald's guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Giuliosi. The trial of Lee Harvey Oswald will continue in a moment here on A&E. The laid-back, folksy defender is from Jackson, Wyoming. Court, please. Proceed. Mr. Giuliosi. My partner, Eddie. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you. I uh, have been doing this a long time. And I have to swear to you something that I think some of you will find hard to believe. And that is that I never start a final argument in a case like this without my belly just going lickety split. And I wonder 
if I can do my job right. And as I began to think about what I was going to say to you folks this evening, as a matter of fact, just a few minutes ago, I began to wonder what it would be if Lee were here. What would he say to me? Um, I think I know what Lee would say. I think he would say, I'm scared, Mr. Spence. I think he'd say, I, I can't explain a lot of these things. I think he would say, I don't know, I don't know what to do. And I think he would look to me for some answers and from, for some reassurance. And maybe I would say to him, Lee, I might say, Lee, you know, when they charge you, uh, that doesn't mean you're guilty in this country. You know, there's got to be 12 good men and true. Find that you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Indeed, the defendant, that's you, Lee, is presumed by the law to be innocent. He has no burden to prove anything. Did you hear that? He has no burden to prove anything. That means that all of the proof has to come from the government. And they have to prove this case to you beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to prove every element of this case beyond a reasonable doubt. And when there are reasonable doubts that are raised by this evidence, which was my obligation to do, fairly if I could, they must dispel those doubts. Not one of them. Not two of them. Not six. 17 of them, but the raft of doubts that you have heard in this case has to somehow disappear unanimously in the minds of every one of you. And I need to say something to you that's very important to me. Each one of you have the power individually to say no if one single doubt remains in your mind. You have the right and the responsibility and the duty to have the courage to say no. And I turn to Lee Oswald and I say, Lee Oswald, this jury, this jury is composed of people that have the courage to say no. And that's what I'd say to Lee Oswald in this case. Well, this is a, a case in which we have searched for the truth. I will tell you there is only one truth. There is only one truth in this case, and that is the truth that nobody knows the truth. Nobody understands the truth. There is one truth in this case, and that is the closet involved here is locked. Still locked. They won't tell us what's in the closet. This man turns to me and suggests to you that I have some obligation to prove something that is in his locked closet. That's the truth that's ultimately involved in this case. Now, I um, would like to talk to you about some very interesting coincidences. Is it just a coincidence that Mrs. Payne was the head of the East-West Committee? A committee at trying to establish relationships purportedly between people in Russia and people in the United States? Is it just a coincidence that the gun that was found purportedly, 
purportedly in her garage is the gun that killed the president. Is it just a coincidence that a letter was left by her typewriter for everybody to see, which said something about a, a, a letter addressed to the Russian embassy and supposedly written by my client? Is it just a coincidence that the job, hear it please, is it just a coincidence that the job that put Lee Harvey Oswald in the bookstore was a job that Mrs. Payne got for him? What about it, Lee? I wish you could tell us. I wish you could explain to us whether those are just coincidences. Please, there are some other coincidences that I'd like to talk to you about. I think about Hostie. Is it just a coincidence that after his death and just, just a few days after his death, Lee's death, that Mr. Hostie destroys at the, at the direction of the FBI a note that Lee had written to the FBI? What did the note really say? Why was, it, why was it destroyed? I mean, is that all just a coincidence? What are the mathematical probabilities of all of that just occurring in that fashion? Did it ever strike you funny that there should be a man who comes into this court and says, we ain't got any brain? I mean, this is America. Uh, this, this is the FBI. This is the National Archives. This is the greatest murder trial in the world. I'll tell you this much, if one of us was charged with murder. And the most important piece of evidence in the whole trial was gone. And it was evidence that we needed to prove our innocence. We needed it to prove our innocence and it was gone. Not one piece but piece after piece of evidence that was necessary for us to prove our evidence was gone, what would we say? We would say, what has happened to this country, wouldn't we? We would say, what kind of a procedure is this? We would say, what kind of a judicial system is this? We would say, what's going on with the FBI? We would say, what is going on in this case? I can hear Lee Oswald saying, I'm a patsy. You know, look at Ruby. Now, you know, let's, let's add to the coincidences. Here is Ruby, long associated with the mafia. Here is Ruby, a man uh, who has had years of experience in relationships with the ugliest vilest, most vicious mafia characters that are known. It, 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 you saw the chart of how Ruby's telephone calls went and suddenly they went sky high, skyrocketed to the mafia characters. Isn't it a coincidence that in room, in the hospital, there was uh, Mr. Ruby again? How comes it appears over and over everywhere? Now, let's look at some other ideas here that I have that I want to talk to you very quickly about. If you were going to pick somebody in this case to set up, who would you pick? Would you pick somebody who was poor and lowly, somebody who couldn't defend himself, somebody who had already set himself up? Would you do that? Let's ask, uh, let's ask some other questions. If you were going to kill the president and you wanted to escape, would you take uh, three seconds to, or one second to pick up the three shells and leave? Was that what you would do? Or would you just leave them there so they could now tie them into the gun? 
with respect to the hiding of the gun, do, would you have figured out some place to hide the gun, or would you just leave it out there almost in plain sight? Would you have shot the president from the place where you work? I mean, if you're going to shoot somebody, do you go down and plan, and plan the shooting so that you do it from your work, and you don't have an escape? You can't drive a car? There's nobody to take you out of there? Is that what you would do? Or was he, as he said, a patsy? And so, where is the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that Lee Harvey Oswald was even there at the bookstore on the sixth floor when the president was shot, much less that he was involved knowingly in any conspiracy to kill our beloved president? Where is the evidence? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I sometimes tell a story in very special cases about an old man and a smart aleck boy and a bird. And this is a very special case. And I want to leave you with this story because it's an important story. It's a story about a smart aleck boy who wanted to show off an old man and to make a fool out of an old man. And the smart aleck boy had a plan as to how he was going to make a fool out of the old man. He'd found a bird out in the, in the wilderness, a little bird that he brought to his, he, he had in his hand. And his plan was to go up to the old man and say to the old man, old man, what do I have in my hand? And the wise old man, would say, you have a bird, my son. And then the smart aleck boy's plan was to say, but wise old man, is the bird alive or is it dead? And if the old man said the bird is dead, then the smart aleck boy would open his hands and the bird would fly off free into the forest and into the woods. But if the old man said, the bird is alive, then the smart aleck boy figured that he would crush it and crush it until all of the life was out of the bird and it was dead. He would open his hands and say, see, wise old man, the bird is dead. And so, and so, The smart aleck boy went to the old man and he said, Old man, what do I have in my hands? And the old man said, You have a bird, my son. He said, Old man, is the bird alive or is it dead? And the old man said, The bird is in your hands, my son. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I give you and place into your hands the history of this country and the case of Lee Harvey Oswald. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spence. Mr. Bugliosi, you may proceed, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, defense counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, based on the evidence in this case, Lee Harvey Oswald is as guilty as sin, and there's nothing that Mr. Spence can do about it. I have yet to see the man who can convince 12 reasonable men and women, as you folks are, that black is white and white is black. Mr. Spence in his argument to you no more desired to look at the evidence in this case than one would have a desire to look directly into the noonday sun. And I can't really blame him because if I were he I wouldn't want to either. Because there's not one tiny grain of evidence, not, not one microscopic speck of evidence that anyone other than Lee Harvey Oswald 
was responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Mr. Spence did say this. It was kind of a subtle, very clever argument. Um, took me a while to grasp exactly what he was doing. I, I think he said this, and if I misrepresent you, sir, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think he said that Lee Harvey Oswald was the exact type of person to set up as a patsy. Or worse to that effect, I'm just paraphrasing him. A Marxist, a defector to Soviet Russia. Actually, he was the exact type of person to murder the president. And my colleague very cleverly turned it around and said he's the exact type of person to make the patsy. Let's take a look at Oswald. Can anyone fail to see how utterly and completely crazy this man here was? Utterly and completely nuts, bonkers? One example among many. And you have to be bonkers to commit a presidential murder. You've got to be crazy, nuts. One example among many. How many Americans, how many people anywhere in the world defect to the Soviet Union? That alone shows how completely and utterly mentally unhinged this man was. Again, the exact type of person to kill the president. Though he may or may not have had any personal dislike for Kennedy, we don't know that. For all we know, maybe he didn't think Kennedy was that bad a person. Everything is relative in life. However, I think one thing is pretty obvious. Kennedy almost undoubtedly would have represented to Oswald the ultimate quintessential representative. That's the key word, representative, of a society for which he had a grinding contempt. On the issue of conspiracy, Mr. Spence, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing him, he, he, he certainly didn't say who specifically murdered the president, but he certainly implied to you that it was some nebulous, some powerful group. He never put the hat on anyone. He kept the hat on his table here. I thought he was going to put it on someone's head, but he didn't. Some mysterious group, powerful group, murdered the president and framed Lee Harvey Oswald, but he didn't say who these people were. He did say the CIA covered up here. He said the FBI covered up there. In which case, if the FBI and CIA were covering up, they'd be the ones who murdered the president, right? Why doesn't Mr. Spence come right out and say it? Why doesn't he accuse the CIA and the FBI of murdering the president? It's one thing you can say about Mr. Spence. He's not a shy man. He knows how to exercise his First Amendment freedom of speech. But he doesn't say it because he's very intelligent, very wise. I'll tell you why he doesn't say it. Because he knows that if he said that the FBI murdered the president or the CIA murdered the president, it would sound downright silly. You'd laugh at him. But even though neither the CIA nor organized crime would have any productive motive whatsoever to kill the president, let's make the unwarranted assumption that they did, that they had such a motive, and let's go on and discuss Mr. Spence's next point about Ruby killing Oswald. The whole notion of sophisticated groups uh, getting like organized crime and U.S. intelligence, getting Jack Ruby of all people to accomplish a job which, if he talked, would prove fatal to their existence is just downright laughable. When Mr. Spence argued that Oswald was just a patsy and was framed, he conveniently neglected to be specific. How was Lee Harvey Oswald framed? When we look at the mechanics of such a possible conspiracy in this case, how could he have been framed? Let's get into the mechanics. Who was this other gunman who, on the day of the assassination, made his way into the book depository building, carrying a rifle, went up to the sixth floor, shot and killed the president, made his way back down to the first floor, floor and escaped without leaving a trace? How, in fact, if Oswald were innocent, did they get Oswald within 45 minutes of the assassination to murder Officer Tippett? Or was he framed for that murder, too? Mr. Spence can't have it both ways if the people who set Oswald up were so sophisticated to come up with this incredible, elaborate conspiracy. I mean, to the point they had people, according to Mr. Spence, who can superimpose this man's head on someone else's body. An imposter down in Mexico City. If they were that bright, why weren't they intelligent enough to know the most obvious thing of all? 
that you don't attempt to frame a man of questionable marksmanship ability who possesses a $19 mail order rifle. As surely as I am standing here, as surely as night follows day, Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, is responsible for the murder of President John F. Kennedy. You are 12 reasonable men and women, and that is why I have every confidence that you will confirm this fact for the pages of history by your verdict of guilty. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. Members of the jury, now that you've heard all of the evidence in the case, as well as the final arguments and summations by the lawyers, it becomes my duty to instruct you on the rules of law that you must follow in arriving at your decision in this case. The indictment is not evidence of guilt. Indeed, the defendant is presumed by the law to be not guilty. He has no burden to prove anything. The United States government has the burden of proving the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And if it fails to do so, you must acquit the defendant. I caution you, members of the jury, that you're here to determine whether the accused is guilty or not guilty from the evidence in this case and nothing else. And with that, we'll stand in recess awaiting the jury determination. Thank you. We'll stand in recess. Please rise. The jury's verdict when we return. You may be seated. I have a note here which reads as follows. Your Honor, we have reached a unanimous verdict dated November 22, 1986, signed Jack Morgan, four person. Mr. Morgan, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. If you would, please, if you'd just hand it to the marshal. You may be seated. Find counsel, if you would please, if you'd please stand. I'll ask Mr. Nelson if he would to please read the verdict. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant Lee Harvey Oswald guilty of the offense charged in one of the indictment. And so the verdict is guilty. Twelve citizens of Dallas, Texas, have found that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in killing President Kennedy. As real as this trial has been, it has lacked one element, the physical presence of the defendant. If Oswald had been alive, would he have taken the stand? And if so, would he have been able to answer the multitude of questions that so many Americans still find unsettling? Of course, we'll never know. And because of that, the question did Lee Harvey Oswald kill President Kennedy will be around for a long time. But for now, at least one jury has given us its verdict. I'm Bill Curtis. I really don't know what, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of, uh, of uh, murdering a policeman. Yeah, there is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's a man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. Uh, in other words, I'm the only person in the background Know the truth pertaining to everything relating to my 
bringing it and has such a material motive for putting a position on him. We'll never let the true fact come of that board to the, to the world. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.